Okay, so today's topic is entitled The Principles of Training. Now, the principles of training provide us with a framework in which if we follow these principles, we should ensure that our client achieves the result that they're aiming for from their program. Now, there are five different ones that we're going to look at, the first one being the principle of progressive overload. You may also see progressive overload written as just as the principle of overload, but it means the same thing. So the question is, what is overload? Overload is when we place the body under a stress that is slightly above what the body is used to because the body adapts to whatever stress, stresses are placed upon it. So in this case, if we do overload a person, as you see from the diagram, what we'd expect to see is the body to go into a slight state of fatigue. From that, the body will go through recovery and then an adaptation. Now that adaptation should either improve our fitness, improve our strength, or improve our muscle mass, depending upon the type of adaptation you were looking for. Now how we overload the body, we can do it in four major ways. So the first way in which we might do it is just by increasing the frequency or the number of times per week a person's working out. Another way in which we can do it is obviously increase the intensity in or how hard the person's working. And thirdly, the time or how long the person's working. Lastly, we may change the type of exercise, so making it a more complex ex exercise or a harder version of the exercise. Any of these different formats can, of overloading can cause adaptations and therefore see improvements in our clientele. And this is what is referred to as the FIT principle, so frequency, intensity, type and time. Now, when we are overloading, there are a couple of important things to take into, into consideration. First off, the rate in which we progress someone. So when we look at it, we should be progressing them in a fairly consistent manner. Okay, by doing this, we're ensuring that we're not going to be overtraining the person and that they should continually see adaptations to their training. Now, if we've got someone who trains quite seriously and trains fairly consistently, we may need to consider a thing called an offload week. Now, with an offload week, what we're trying to do is allow their body a little bit more recovery. And from that, a further adaptation should take place that will allow us to continually progress that person on. So this is really something that we require for people who train fairly consistently and fairly seriously. Another thing that needs to be taken into consideration is a starting point that we put a person on. Now, obviously, the point at which we start someone has to be taken in, we have to take things into consideration like their training age, how much they've trained before, and what we think their body can handle at this point in time. We don't want to push a person too hard too fast. We don't want to put them at a level in which their body can't handle. So you're not going to get a new trainer and put them on the same program as someone who's trained for a fair number of years because we're likely to see problems and we're likely to see injuries if we do something like that. Now, if we do push them too hard too fast, it can lead to a thing called overtraining. So we are trying to overload the body, but we don't want to get to a state of overtraining. Now, overtraining itself is when we get accumulated stresses within the body, either from training or from a person's lifestyle. These stresses can combine and basically they will cause the body to change in terms of its functioning and we'll see a decrease in a person's athletic performance. Now, this decrease can last anywhere from several weeks up to months and has actually been seen as being a precursor to chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's important that we understand what to look for when we're looking for overtraining because if we can avoid it, that's obviously very good for our client and very good for us. So some of the warning signs you'll see here, uh, we can see a decrease in performance, as we've already said. Uh, a person may lose, ap lose their appetite, so therefore body weight loss may come from it. Uh, one of the other things that overtraining tends to do is decrease our immune system. So we're likely to see some infections taking place within the person. So just common colds, flus, those types of things. Uh, we can also see mental issues. So one of the things you may see is a person's personality may change. So if a person becomes a little bit more erratic, then that may be, an over that may be a warning sign. Uh, sleep disturbances come in with that as well. So if a person changes in terms of their sleep patterns, that may be a sign. Uh, increased muscle soreness. So we obviously expect muscle soreness to come from our training. But if a person is still at you know, a peak level of soreness more than 72 hours out of a training session, then that is a symptom uh, of overtraining. And the last one there, you can see an elevated uh, heart rate, uh, blood lactate levels, or even blood pressure. So they're things that we can actually measure to make sure that a person you know, isn't suffering from overtraining. Now, one of these in by itself isn't actually a sign that we're really in overtraining, but if you see a person uh, showing a couple of these symptoms, 
then that's something you need to actually look into. Now the next principle we're going to talk about is the principle of specificity, otherwise known as the SED principle. Now SED stands for Specific Adaptation to Impose Demands. And all this means is that the body will adapt to the stresses that are placed upon it. So if I want to be a good runner, the best thing I can do is run. If I want to be a good swimmer, the best thing I can do is swim. If I swim when I'm a runner, yes, it will help me with my health, but it's not going to help me with my running ability. So basically what that means is that we need to make our training as specific as possible the type of adaptation we're looking for. So if I play a sport, I want to try and replicate the demands of that sport in my training. The closer I can replicate it, the better the training results will come. The further I move away from it, generally the less the results will be in terms of improving my performance. So that's just something we need to take into consideration when we're training someone. We also have to watch out for the fact that if a person does train one form, one facet of training, okay, it may have a negative effect on other facets. So say I went out and started training for a marathon, okay, I would likely to see some form of muscle mass loss in my legs and therefore some power output loss in my legs because of the fact that having excess muscle on my legs when I'm training for a marathon is something that's a disadvantage for training for that sport. So we've got to make sure we understand that if I do have, do one form of training, it may have an effect on another facet of a person's fitness level. The next principle is the principle of individualization. And this one just basically says that we're all individuals, so we're all different. And that a number of factors are going to obviously play a role in the way in which I adapt to my training. Now, obviously the main one is a hereditary nature. So basically we're born with a certain bunch of genetics and that will predetermine to a certain degree how our body shape will take place and how we will respond to training. So this is just something that needs to be taken into consideration. A one size fits all approach to exercise doesn't necessarily work. Other things that we can take into consideration is obviously the experience. A, an experienced trainer will adapt differently to someone who's just starting off. Uh, psychological issues and this generally comes down to motivational factors how hard a person's willing to push themselves someone who's trained in sport and worked really hard in the past knows how hard they can push themselves whereas someone who's never exercised before is not as likely to push themselves to their limits we've got things like gender and obviously the male female differences there are differences within our body so therefore we would expect differences in terms of the way in which we adapt to our training and then lastly there are our abilities now, all of these things need to be taken into consideration when you consider the amount of work, the load that we place upon someone, and the type of training, because they're all going to play a role in terms of how a person is going to respond to that exercise. The next principle we look at is the principle of variation. And simply put, if you keep training a person the same way all the time, even if they are trying to overload themselves and push themselves to their limit, eventually using the same training stimulus over and over again will start to lose its effect. So you won't continually see the same good results. So what we need to do with our people is to make sure we add some variety to the training. By providing different stimuluses, whether it be through volume or type of training, it will allow us to get faster results for our clients. So we can't just give them the same program over and over again and expect to get the same results. There needs to be an adequate amount of variation within the training to ensure that the person continually receives the results they're aiming for. The last principle we're just going to look at is the principle of reversibility. And as it says there, it's pretty much the use it or lose it principle. So as soon as you stop exercising, your body is going to further adapt to that new level of stimulus. So no stimulus means that I don't need as much muscle mass, I don't need as much fitness, I don't need as much flexibility. So I'm going to start to lose all of those facets that I may have built up. So one thing we've got to consider is that if we are becoming, if we are changing the way in which we train a program, train a client, we need to make sure that we're trying to maintain all the facets of fitness that we've built up. Now, how quickly we lose these things generally depends upon how long we've had it. The longer you've had a high level of fitness, generally your body will try and actually hold on to it. Whereas if you're just starting off and you've just started to build a, a higher level of fitness, you're probably going to lose it fairly quickly if you become inactive. So the key is obviously trying to maintain everything that we have actually built up and obviously not going through any long periods of inactivity. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.